Welcome to another edition of Sci-Fi Journal, presented by the Rhode Island Science Fiction Club. This is for October 2011. My name is Mark Morriso. Also hosting the show today are Calvin Watts III, Jay Kingston, and James Hinsey. Yep. Ooh, spooky show. Because we have to look at Jay for the whole hour. Okay. <laughs> We're all back together. <laughs> We're all back together again. Yay. For 15 years. The gang's all 15 years, I know. new season. Uh, whatever. Yeah. Something like that. It's like being married, for God's sakes. It's crazy. I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And as always, we begin talking about the wonderful world of movies with a segment we like to call Popcorn Previews. Take it away, Jay. We're going to jump right in with uh, a seasonal film. This one is called Arthur Christmas. Stars the voice talents of James McAvoy uh, and Hugh Laurie and Jim Broadbent. And it's an animated look at how Santa Claus is able to not only package but deliver those Christmas presents all in one night. Hmm. And it, it looks pretty funny, but we'll let you judge that. Summertime when the weather is high, you can stretch right up and touch the sky when the weather's bad. Hi! Wow! Middle of summer. I know what you're thinking about. Christmas! <laughs> I know, I can't wait either. Here, yeah, come on. I've got something really amazing to show you. But you promise you won't show loads of people or stick it on the internet? Oh, Here, look. Gift, gift wrap elves, elves, attention! Yes, yes sir! sir! Santa's Damn. airborne gift wrap medallion, the green ribbons. Present arms! Nice precision scissors, take guns, gift wrap, Santa patterns! Brilliant! On my count, wrap that! That, sir? Let me hear your Christmas noise! Ho, 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 sir! Ho, 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 go, go, go! Quick, this way, bro! Hey, this is top secret! Turn that off! Arthur Christmas. Wow! That's one big teddy bear! Coming in November. There's nothing coming in November. Go back to your summer. <laughs> no polar bears in mission control. Okay, next. We've got Ghost Rider, Spirit of Vengeance. <laughs> starring do we, do Mark's we, favorite do actor. Do we really have to? <laughs> starring Mark's favorite actor in the uh, whole wide world, uh, Nicolas Cage. Nicolas, you've yeah. made too many movies, So, Cage. So this yes. is not... A sequel. It's a reboot. It's a reboot. But, but <laughs> <laughs> how can you have a reboot with the same guy in the title role? Can somebody explain that to me? I don't know. He's got he's got money to burn. He's, literally. I think he bought the rights to it or something. Right. I, I have mm. no idea. But it's it's a reboot and. Uh, once again, uh, he's trying to come to grips with being the Ghost Rider. Mm -hmm. His head's on fire. And he urinates fire. <laughs> yes. Let's watch. Take 
a new form. One more powerful than he's ever known. Next, we have Hugo, the story of a young boy whose father has mysteriously disappeared and left behind an automaton, a clockwork man. But nobody knows how to get this thing running. So he goes to look for his father and runs into another young girl, a stranger, who happens to have a key around her neck, which fits into the mechanism that activates the automaton. So here I am about to make like a joke, like maybe you should wind him up, and, and it turns out that's actually something that really happens? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. It actually happens. And it's a family adventure, and it looks like a lot of fun, and it kind of takes place uh, at the cusp of the age of steam, between steam and electricity and all that stuff. So it's kind of like a steampunk adventure type movie. Kind of. It's on the fringes. Cool. But it looks, it looks like a good family film. So let's take a look at that. What is it? It's a wind up figure. Like a music box. Who built him? I would think a magician. You see this? A keyhole in the shape of a heart. Another mystery. I fixed the... It was a fire. You're coming with me. Where are your parents, little man? I love secrets. So you're all alone? Not completely. Where did you get this? Why would my key fit into your father's machine? Do you want to have an adventure? Stop that child! Apprehend! It's drawing. I think it's a message for my father. This is a treacherous place, do you understand? Watch your step. It's Neverland and Oz and Treasure Island all wrapped into one. Are you sure about this? We could get into trouble. That's how you know it's an adventure. My life has taught me happy endings only happen in the movies. The story's not over yet. Um, next we have The Adventures of Tintin. Now this is based on the old comic strip, right. The Adventures of Tintin. Which is very popular in Europe, but Americans aren't really familiar with it all that much. And it's not Rin Tintin. It's not, not the German no. Shepherd, no. 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 Um, <laughs> let's see. It's, Although the um, movie might be a dog, we don't know. Shut up! Okay. <laughs> oh, good lord. Um, Did I distract you? It's not that difficult. I can't but. read my own writing. Okay. It uh, stars the voice talents of uh, Jamie Beer, 
Um, Andy Serkis, Ooh. who yep. we know as Gollum and as uh, Caesar, um, Caesar from Caesar. the recent Planet of the Apes. Yep. And Daniel Craig, James Bond. Very nice. And it's uh, Tintin goes on an adventure over the seas with he with uh, some he runs into the regular characters. It's a CGI movie. With. It's no, CGI, right? It's, uh, it's it's not live action. No, it's not live action. It's I don't know what form of animation it is, to mm. tell you the truth. It looks kind of CGI, but it looks kind of... It looks good. Cell, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. cell. It looks kind of cell, too. Right. But hmm. Maybe it's both mixed. I don't know. But okay. it looks good. It's a movie. Take a look. I don't think you realize this, but you're about to walk into a whole mess of danger. A unicorn. What secrets do you hold? How could you let them escape? Turn back. Not now. Not now. And uh, last but not least, we have it's about time. the Pirates! Exclamation point. Band of Misfits. Now this is done by the same crew who brings you Wallace and Gromit. Oh, cool. So if you're familiar with Wallace <clears throat> and Gromit, it's by the same uh, creators who uh, who created Wallace and Gromit, like Ooh. I just said. Right. And this involves the comic misadventures of a pirate who is rather proud of his very curly beard. And uh, it, it just follows his misadventures across the seas. He goes from one mishap to another. And it looks pretty funny. And it's, it's done in that uh, almost a claymation style. Hmm. And uh, it, it looks really, really good. And it stars the voice talents of Hugh Grant and the former doctor, David Tennant. There you go. Yay. So, let's take a look at that. vicious nature and their ruthless ways. One pirate is more feared than them all. Lost! I'm the pirate captain. And I'm here for your gold. Gold? Afraid we don't have any gold, old man. This is a leper boat. See? Behind every captain is a crew. Sure, some of you are as ugly as a sea cucumber. Uh, some of you are closer to being a chair or coat rack than a pirate. And some of you are just fish I've dressed up in a hat. Hey, oh, hoist the flag! Standard, sir. Uh, gruesome. Extra gruesome. Let's make their gizzards shake. We're having a little trouble with pirates, Your Majesty. I hate pirates! Ha, huh, we laugh in the face of danger. I don't. I don't really like danger at all. An actual pirate? Obviously. Duh. Can we get there? Well, yes. But unfortunately, there's this dirty great sea monster in the way. I think they just add those onto maps for decoration. Is that a fact? See, I told you! The pirates. Band of misfits. Aha! I'm the pirate captain and the ghost ship. Ooh. So, Ardman Animation, uh, who's sort of like the Pixar of England, they've done all these films that have just been very successful, uh, award-winning, Oscar-winning films, uh, 
Chicken Run, the Wallace and Gromit uh, Where Rabbit one, and mm -hmm. uh, Flushed Away. Yep. And uh, with this one, uh, I can't tell if it's CGI or, or the claymation. Well, it's got that jerky kind of look to it, you know? It's, uh, it looks like it's claymation type of thing. So right. they may have gone back to the drawing board and started all over again. Yeah, I think, and I think that works really well for them. Mm -hmm. But it looks great. And that opens in March, the end of March of uh, 2012. Nice. And that's all I've got for popcorn previews for this month. Wonderful. Good. Thank you, Jay. Let's move on to Game Over with Calvin Watts. Take it away, Calvin. I have actually like home video news this month, isn't that you cool? You do? Your yeah, own I, home I, videos? Huh? Well, no, not oh, the old right. home videos. <laughs> like the, the, I latest, was the latest in Blu-ray and DVD and 3D technology. But cool. this one, this one's really cool. It's been rumored for a while. And while it hasn't been officially announced, it's just basically on the verge of being officially announced. We've talked about it in the past, about uh, Star Trek The Next Generation going the remastered route. Right. Um, like the original series did with new special effects and whatnot. And Bill Hunt, who runs the digitalbits.com, which is a really, really good website if you're into movies and, and home theater and that sort of stuff, he's, he's all but confirmed from his contacts at CBS Paramount that later on this year, they're going to release a Blu-ray sampler disc with four episodes from the next generation that have been remastered, um, including the, the original um, two-part opener, Encounter at Farpoint, which back then was state-of-the-art special effects, right. but now look really bad. Yeah. Um, also, Sins and the Father, which is uh, the Worf yep. family episode, right. and The Inner Light, which is probably the oh, most acclaimed episode yeah. in the whole series. That's the best next-gen yeah. episode ever. I think um, so. It looks like Paramount is really getting behind this, so you can look forward to seven seasons of being remastered, redone. Now, do you know if the remaster is coming out in Blu-ray only, or standard DVD and Blu-ray? They haven't said, but I, w I think to order to maximize profits, I think you're looking at a Blu-ray only right. release. But obviously more on that as we get into it. Uh, what else do I have? As we speak and as we're talking, the Star Wars stuff has been released on Blu-ray. That's right. Now, it wouldn't be George Lucas if, if he didn't he screw up something. Screw up <laughs> and, and stop messing around what with stuff. What did he do stuff. this time? So some of the stuff from the last set of releases, right. he, he's actually fixed and, and says some other stuff that he didn't need to fix. Okay. So the stuff that he has fixed, which is good, um, from episode one, the really bad looking Yoda puppet has been redone and it's gone and now there's a CG Yoda. So okay. it's in line with the second and third movies. Right. And it, it makes for a much better shot because that Yoda was just horrible. Mm. And it, he interacts a little bit with Samuel Jackson, so it looks better. Mm -hmm. um, also, when they did the, the music remix in Episode 4, A New Hope, when the, the X-Wings are going to fight into the Death Star, there's a, there's a point where John Williams' score is just blaring through, and, it, and it's really, really good. But the, right. the, the last release, the, it, it really got dumbed down for like the special effects, and it really oh. sucked, for yeah. lack of a better word. Ah. And, and that's been fixed. So that's, that's the good stuff. That's the good stuff. Bad stuff, in, in my opinion. Again, going back to episode four, New Hope, when uh, Luke gets attacked by the Tusken Raiders. Yes, okay. And, you know, Ben comes over and saves him. Uh, the Tusken Raiders, if you remember correctly, they're, they're all going nuts, and all of a sudden you hear this really horrific roar, mm. and it's Obi-Wan imitating a, a crap dragon call. Yeah. And, and, it, and it sounded pretty cool. Well, right. it, it's been redone, and it just sounds really awful. Yeah. I can't do it justice because it really sounds awful. Okay. But as bad as that is, for whatever reason, in Return of the Jedi, which yep. is the weakest out of the three films, in the climactic battle with Luke and Vader with the Emperor, when the Emperor is trying to kill him with the lightning bolts, and, and Vader finally has an epiphany and realizes that he still has good in him, and he picks up the Emperor and, and throws it over. He doesn't say anything. Right. And he doesn't need to. 
the scene works perfectly as it is. Yeah. He just comes to a decision, he picks him up, throws him over, it's, it's a silent, powerful thing, and it works. But no, we <laughs> couldn't leave that alone. It's kind of like when Luke falls down uh, the, the shaft in, in Best Friend and he right. starts screaming. Yep. So Vader decides to, when he comes to his decision, now he says, no. Yeah. And then you get a, no. And no, it doesn't work. Right. <sighs> so no to the no. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. It, it's still an awesome set, especially you know for the extra supplemental material that you haven't seen in ages. Right. And I can pretty much bet every collectible that I have that when the 3D versions of the films that are still being planned come out on Blu-ray in a few years, they'll be even further redone, edit things, whatever you want to call them. Hmm. So. And does Han shoot first? Unfortunately, mm. not. Mm. <sighs> don't well. get don't get me started. Anyways, moving on. Um, out now, basically coming out at the very end of September, since we're in October, so it's already out. Transformers: Dark of the Moon, but it is a movie only disc, I guess, because Michael Bay really wants to make the special editions oh. really spiffy. So, okay. um, sometime next year. So, but if you're looking for the special edition stuff, he says it'll be worth the wait. Um, you probably make this fancy box set that transforms into a couch so you can have something to sit on while you're watching it and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also coming out this month, Green Lantern, which unfortunately did not do all that well at the box office. But they've green lighted a sequel. See how I moved didn't that do good in awesome. it? Didn't do good in the United States, but worldwide it did. Right. It, it did okay. Well. It, it did enough to justify a sequel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, an extended cut of the theatrical movie will be released on the 14th. I'll be there. So, I'll, I'll be picking it up. Sounds good. That was a good movie. Uh, moving on to video games really quick. We're into the, the meat of the video game season. So, a lot of big titles have already been released, including Gears of War 3, which I'll give you a little review on, on that next month. I'm looking forward to playing okay. that. Um, two of the biggest oh, titles. Oh, now you can play as a girl. In yes, this one. you can choose a female. Character. You can choose a female character. All, all the female games were complaining, so they they put a female character in there, which is good. And just as tough as the guy character. It's there a great game. It, that's a great series. Um, but yeah, and in the middle of the firefight, you can say, "Oh, I broke a nail. Time out." Mm, no, not so. this one. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, after she stomps your face and, and rips your head off with the chainsaw. That's marriage. There you go. <laughs> Anyways. Um, two of the biggest games coming out this month include Battlefield 3, which is uh, yep. the EA's follow-up shooter, and it, it's going to be going head-to-head -head with the Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, which will come out in November. It's getting rave reviews, and a lot of people are saying it's better than Call of Duty. Wow. Um, I will get the chance to play it at some point, and I will give you my opinion on a future episode. Sounds good. But the one I'm really looking forward to, which I've been looking forward to for a while, is Batman Arkham City. Finally yes. gets it released in the middle of October, and, and this just looks like geek fun all the way around. Right. Again, uh, a review will be forthcoming, and I'll be heavily into that hmm. very soon. Um, and last but not least, we don't really do a lot of Nintendo Wii coverage simply because the Wii really hasn't been relevant in a, in a while. Yeah, I'm it's sorry. Unfortunate. But, but My it's, daughter uses the Wii more than I do. I can't, can't do it. But it's true. But for the first time in, in probably well over a year, I'm going to be picking up a Wii game. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword has an actual release uh, time. It's going to be coming out the middle of December, just before in time for Christmas. The reason why I mention this is because if you pre-order the game, they have a, a, a special edition uh, gold edition. All the previous Zeldas have had like a gold edition, going back to like the original that like, came out in like a gold cartridge case and right. whatnot. I mention this uh, especially for you earlier adapters because during the middle of the Wii life cycle, life cycle they switched the controller to have more accuracy and they called it like Motion Plus and originally right. they had a little adapter that you could plug onto mm. the mm. new controllers to make it work and you could still buy those although they're harder to find because now they just have everything all into one unit. Well, if you get the special edition of the game, you get a special gold Motion Plus controller that comes oh. with it. And, and you'll save money by getting the bigger package. So I'm looking forward to playing that. Yeah. And that'll be out in December. That's all I got. Cool. Oh, one thing I want to mention for gaming news, Star Trek Online mm -hmm. is going free to play 
Really? Either at the end of this year or, or early 2012, Cryptic Studios has decided the Champions Online model that went free to play last year was so successful they're making more money by going free to play and then you have to pay for the extra stuff than to do a monthly subscription. Oh. So if you buy Star Trek Online, um, right now the people who have like um, lifetime memberships, mm -hmm. um, they'll still get all the perks when it goes free to play. But for everyone else, as of the end of this year or early 2012, Star Trek Online, free to play, download it and there you go. Cool. All right, thank you, Calvin. Now let's move on to Anime Daisuke with James Hinsey. Here we go for uh, Anime Daisuke. First, uh, the Gundam.info website, there's an English version of that website, um, is streaming the first three Mobile Suit Gundam anime trilogy uh, films that were based on the original series, and they recut them into like three films. So, and it's subtitled, and it's also on YouTube. So you can actually watch the whole three uh, trilogy there on YouTube. Uh, G Kids, which is a, a distributor here in uh, North America has got a deal with Studio Ghibli to distribute 13 of uh, Miyazaki's films um, for North America. Now this is for theatrical rights, so if you want to rent a uh, Miyazaki film, um, you can do so through G-Kids. Um, Disney still has the home video rights for all those films. Let's see. Uh, the, the director, David Ellis, who just did Shark Night 3D, and he did uh, a couple of the Final Destinations and Snakes on a Plane. Uh, hmm. That was a good one. Anyway, he's going to do a live action version of Kite, uh, Yasuomi Umetsu's uh, anime uh, called Kite, K-I-T-E. It's about um, a young girl who, uh, whose father was killed by some corrupt uh, security force guys who are into... Uh, um, Kite flying? Women, mm. you know, women slavery. Uh, okay. Fem yeah. So um, she fo she partners up with uh, her dad's. Uh, her, her dad was a cop uh, to, with his old partner to try to solve uh, who killed her father, and uh, so it's been very popular. Um, and so they will get a live action version of it. And then uh, Oron High School Host Club. Uh, oh, my daughter loves that show. Yeah, the yeah. anime? Yeah. Well, there's been a live action television series for Oran High School Host Club. I did not know that. Yes. And now they've announced with the live mm -hmm. action cast, they're going to do a film version. So they're going to work on that, uh, and it'll come out, uh, I think, in a, uh, about a year or so. They'll have to do that yeah. as a series of movies, I um, suppose. By, uh, I suppose, but I mean, you know, the, the series, the TV series is... Well, there's the manga, there's the anime, right. and then there's live action TV series. Now, this is going to be a story they're going to create just for the movie, uh, and it might tie in somewhat with the series, but cool. and maybe they'll do more of that. Now, is there any way to watch the live action TV show right now? Uh, not yet here in the U.S. Okay. I don't think it's streamed or or showing anywhere. All right. Um, and then um, where did I put that satellite dish? <laughs> okay. All right. So then. Um, the original Gogeta film, Godzilla, or Gojiro, Go Gojira, uh, Criterion is looking to maybe put out a, a DVD or Blu-ray of it. Um, they have like a little image of Godzilla on their Facebook page, sort of hinting that they're going to do this uh, release. And this will be the original film in Japanese. Um, I guess they found a, a pristine version of the film, a print, and they're going back to that. and. Uh, It'll probably include a copy of the uh, Raymond Burr version, the American version of uh, Godzilla, yep. King of the Monsters. Um, I have uh, the DVD that was released in 2006 by Classic Media, which has both versions. And I really enjoy the original because I never really got to see that as a kid. Now, are, are they going to yeah. remake the 1998 version and, and put that on uh, there? <laughs> no. However, speaking of the new version, there is going to be a new Godzilla uh, right now directed by Gareth Edwards, who did Monsters, uh, produced 
by um, uh, Legendary Pictures, who did a bunch of the, these films recently, and um, David Goyer, who did the script for Batman and Man of Steel, the new Superman one, right. is doing the script for uh, this remake of Godzilla, an American version, um, and uh, that'll come out 2014, I guess. Hopefully, they'll go back to more of an original design. I just saw that Stan Winston of Stan Winston Studios had done a Godzilla design. Really? And it looks very much like the classic original Godzilla, Good. but a little that, more. That's the man to go to if you're going to yeah. have him do it. Yeah, yep. but less of a suit, but more musculature in the arm. Um, so we'll see how that goes. And, and I'm looking forward to at least the, the new Blu-ray version. Nice. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that's it for Anime Daisuke. All right, wonderful. Thank you, James. Let's move on to a segment talking about the wonderful world of television that we like to call Tube News. All right, got some funky stuff for you guys this month. Are you ready? No. Some shows that are, all right, never mind. Some uh, shows that are premiering in October. First off, big news, very excited, yep. Walking Dead, October 16th. Yep. Be there or be square. Excellent. Awesome stuff. AMC, station that's running it, okay? But also, there's um, some series I want to talk about. One is called American Horror Story on FX. It premieres Wednesday, October 5th at 10 p.m. If you like Twin Peaks, you'll like this particular show. Um, it's a psychosexual thriller. It comes from Ryan Murphy, who produced Glee. And what we know is that the action begins after a couple and their daughter move from Boston to L.A. into a haunted Victorian mansion. Although it seems to me they should move from yeah. L.A. to Boston. To move into a series. haunted yeah. Victorian mansion. And some very freaky stuff goes down. The series stars Dylan McDermott, Connie Britton, True Blood's Dennis O'Hare as Larry the Burn Guy, and Jessica Lange. Uh, the pilot is 90 minutes long, 90 minutes long, has eight cliffhangers, and features, features a fanged claw, a creature with claws. Eight? Eight cliffhangers. Okay. And a fanged creature with claws. Just in time for the commercial break. Kind of like Jay when he gets up in the morning, all right? So, if you could take something that sounds as strange as Twin Peaks that might have a weird for weird sake type of yeah. uh, venue, that's the show for you. Next up, Death Valley, which premiered Monday, August 29th at 10.30 p.m. on MTV. What's it about? I'll tell you. Vampires, werewolves, and zombies from the streets of California's San Fernando Valley. Oh my. Yep, and it's up to the undead task force to capture and or kill them. Um, it's up to the camera crew that's following them to capture all of this footage. So it's like a monstrous take on Reno 911 or Cops. Cops, yes, it is. I've yeah. seen some of it, and it's, you know, it depends on your sense of humor. Right. Um, but, you know. I, th I think it'll appeal mostly to a high school, college. Yeah. Raunchy type humor. Yeah. Do you like it? I haven't seen it. So. Oh. <laughs> so they're not going to cancel it anytime. Probably so. not. No, it's on my DVR, so we'll see. I wonder if that counts. If I watch a show that's DVR, will it still get canceled? Yes. You think so? Yes. Oh, well. I don't know if you're, you're... I tried. All right. Next up, we have Once Upon a Time on ABC, which premieres Sunday, October 23rd at 8 p.m. What's it about? Lost Adam Horowitz and Edward Kitsis. Say that. Edward Kitsis. Say that five times fast. Dig into the story about... What happens when fairy tales and the modern world collide? In the series, a 28-year-old bail bonds collector and her son end up in a town called Storybrook, a New England town filled with strange characters who may just be fairy tale creatures who have forgotten who they are. And they live in Storybrook. And they live in Storybrook. What a coincidence. Why not just move to Salem? I don't know. <laughs> That'd be more convenient. Yep. Or it's like uh, Halloween, Halloween Town. Right. On, yeah. Yeah. Yep. It stars Jennifer Morrison, uh, Lena Perilla, Jennifer Goodwin, Josh Dallas, a whole bunch of other people you've never heard of. And it stars Stargate Universe's Robert Carlyle as Rumpelstiltskin. Hmm. Interesting stuff. And then last but not least, it's not um, a TV show, but it is available uh, online on the web. It's a web webisode type thing. It's on the Sci-Fi channel, sci-fi.com. That's sci-fi with a Y. Why? It, it, it's. 
Um, it's called The Mercury Man. It's a 10 episode series. Each episode runs about seven minutes. Um, it takes place in Pittsburgh, 1975. There you go. Um, Edward Borman, a lowly government office drone, finds himself trapped when the deadly men of Mercury sees his office building as a staging ground for their nefarious plot. Give me a da da da. Da da da. Aided by Jack Yeager, a daring aerospace engineer from a mysterious organization known as the League, Edward must stop the invaders and their doomsday device, the gravity engine. So if you like the old fashioned black and yeah. white serials, That's what I was Buck thinking. Rogers, Flash Gordon, mm -hmm. The Rocketeer. That okay. Fun. If you like those type of shows, that's a particular episode. So you can catch it on um, <laughs> Sci-Fi Channel's website. You don't want to know why they're chuckling. And now his phone goes off. Okay. And then, last but not least, it's got nothing to do with television, but it's something that I want to bring up: the Brown Coat Ball. Yes. Takes the Brown place Coat in October. Ball. October. Right here. Yep. Right here in in Rhode Island. It's over at the Inn at the Crossings in Warwick, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. It's um, October 21st to the 23rd. So if you're a huge Firefly, Serenity fan, uh, Brown Gold Ball is usually held in different parts of the country. Yes. And this year it's in Rhode Island. So you can go to their website, browncoatball.com. It's going to be a big shindig. It's going to be a big shindig. And you get all that information. And that's all I have, mercifully, for our Tube News. Okay, this uh, month's roundtable uh, concerns the advent of e-readers. Um, tablets, books on computer, and things like the Kindle, the Nook, right. and uh, vice versa. And the effect that it's having on the publishing world and bookstores in general. And uh, just to give you a uh, quick summary of some facts that I found on the computer, besides Borders and Walden Books, here alone in the Northeast, just in the Northeast, in the past few years, I think in the past five years, I found evidence of at least 40 bookstores that had closed for good, mm. closed their doors. Mom and pop bookstores, some bigger bookstores that were you know, doing well for years and years and years, just dried up. And it seems to coincide with the beginning of the e-reader phenomenon. Um, people getting their, even, even getting their uh, newspapers delivered on the computer uh, seems to have affected the mom and pop uh, variety of bookstores. And my question that I'm posing this month is, are e-readers going to become something that fades away eventually? Are they here to stay? Or if they are here to stay, is it going to spell the end of print as we know it? So what do you guys figure? I don't, I, it's here to stay, but I don't think it will spell the end of print. Uh, when television came out, people thought the same thing about movies. Why would people go out and spend money to see a movie when they can watch it on TV? But obviously we have both. And with e-readers, there are still people who are going to want to look at print and are more comfortable sitting in bed reading a book. So it's going to stay. But I think the bookstore is going to have to change. And what I'm thinking is that in the future, they'll go to a bookstore because you can see a selection of titles in a very convenient um, method. If you go online, you really don't know what's new or from the less popular authors. So you go into a bookstore, they'll have probably bookshelves with only one title in it. You'll pick out what you want and go to the register and pay for it and buy it. And in the back room, they'll actually print out another copy of that book to put on the shelf. And so the only multiple copies you'll have be like Tom Clancy or Stephen King novels that just came out that you know people are going to want to buy, a lot of people are going to buy it at the same time. But it'll be sort of like a self-publishing thing where they'll get it electronic transmitted um, from the publisher and they'll publish in the back room and that's simply because people need to browse I and mean, that's how you find new stuff. Well hmm. if that does happen I think it'll really put a serious dent in the collecting market as far as books go because um, 
just use this as an example. This is Justice League number one of the new 52. DC just recently revamped right. all of their, their comic book lines. Yeah. Hmm. And they've got 52 brand new titles being introduced this month. This is number one. Now, this may or may not become collectible eventually. But you can't go and get an e-reader and say, pick up a copy of Tom Clancy's newest novel and say, oh wow, I've got Tom Clancy's newest novel. This is going to be worth something someday. It's not going to be worth anything. Right. If it's on an e-reader, it's not going to be worth anything except to the person who owns the e-reader. Hmm. But, but actually, too, most of those mass-produced, uh, mass-publication print books are not collectible at all. You find them in used bookstores all the time. Right. The, the other things, that, the ones that are collectible, and, and I think it's only within the sci-fi and fantasy genres that we really see this, are people collecting books that are out of print. I have 2,000 books in my house, half of which I have not read yet, but most of them are well, out of print from the 50s, the 50s, the 40s, the 60s. Um, and, you know, I love those books. Even though I haven't read them yet, I just love them because they're, they're mine. I know uh, they're very hard to get. Um, you know, if I had money, I'd go through a used bookstore and pick up every book that I don't have mm -hmm. just to have them. Mm -hmm. um, I should be like a librarian, but I'm, I'm working <laughs> on that anyway. The, but the you know, t best sellers and stuff, you know, people read them, they're done with it, they discard them or they give them to somebody else or they try to sell them in their yard sale um, or take them to used bookstores. So well, I think as, as book lovers, science fiction and fantasy fans yeah. are kind of unique anyway in the fact that we hoard books. That's right. Um, at one point, um, I had, I don't know how many bookcases in my house, two deep mm -hmm. on each shelf, and I had actually overloaded shelves into the bookcase. Mm -hmm. I actually converted it so that I could fit more paperbacks on the bookshelf than it was designed to fit. Right. And I had two deep, and I had some stacked on top of those going sideways. Yeah. And I had at least six tall, six-foot bookcases jam-packed with books that I had not only bought, but yeah. read. And you can't get an author to sign an e-book. No. Unless you're sort of technically buying it directly from them. Like you can, like uh, John Scalzi, you know, he started publishing his stuff online. Right. You know, selling it directly to readers. Um, so in a way, you're getting it directly from the author. It's sort of like his personal copy that you're getting. Hmm. Right. You know? So that's good if you're into collecting, but if you're not, if you like reading, but you're not necessarily into collecting the book itself, then an e-reader might not, not necessarily be such a bad thing. Right. Like now, because it will give you access to hundreds of thousands of books that you would never find if you went to a local bookstore. They just don't have the volume or the space to be able to carry that many, right. that many books. So, now, in, so in a way, an e-reader would become an advantage. A lot of people were wondering what happened to Borders because Borders seemed to be good, you know, for a long time. They right. seemed to be strong. They were a going concern. And then, lo and behold, we started hearing rumors last mm. year that they're closing, they're losing money, they're closing. Right. According to the research that I came across, Borders had not made a profit since 2006. Mm. So they had something intrinsically wrong with the corporate structure itself. It's more than that. I get USA Today and the New York Times, and one of them had an article about the border situation. They said the problem cropped up because they made a deal with Amazon to handle um, distribution through the mail. Right. And the article said you shouldn't make a deal like that with a company who wants to see you out of business. Mm. And Amazon basically sort of stared their customers to the Amazon. Yeah. Where if you ordered something through Borders, it went to Amazon, and Amazon shipped it out, and all of a sudden email, people who bought this book also bought so-and-so, and people went directly to Amazon. That was one of the problems. The second is that the e-reader, I believe they developed their e-reader later than Amazon or Barnes & Noble, right. so they weren't in it early enough. And the third, which is my opinion, is some bad business decisions. I work in Newport Middletown. We used to have two Walden books. And when Borders bought them out, they closed those 
down, but they never opened anything in the area. Barnes & Noble did, so Barnes & Noble almost has a monopoly in new books on Aquidneck Island. Right. So I don't know what the purpose is of shutting those two down if you're not going to open and have a presence remaining there. So it was just some stupid business Absolutely. decision. Yeah. So what do you think the future is for our bookstores? I think bookstores are going to remain. Mm -hmm. But I think it's going to be, I, 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 right now, the giant on the block is Barnes & Noble. Right. We may see a foreign chain of bookstores come here and make a big push. Maybe there's some kind of a big English or German bookstore chain that is going to make some kind of an in-row in the United States somewhere. It doesn't take much. All they need is one big store in New York or Boston, uh, another big store in Chicago, another big or store in Los Angeles. How about something like this? A discount bookstore. Books a, mi Books a Million just bought 14 border stores that closed. Mm -hmm. And they're going to open them back up as Books a Million stores. And they're like a discount chain, so I mean, you're buying, they're buying in bulk, you know, I mean, all they, the books. They're kind, of, they're kind of like the dollar store of the book world? Yeah, okay. they're well, you need, you need, stuff. You need print books to do that. If there's not enough bookstores, eventually there won't be enough discount books for them to buy. Well, yeah, but still, I mean, they're opening. It's a temporary solution. Well, I still think you're going to have mom and pop stores. Right. Yeah. They're going to have to reinvent themselves. They're going to have to reinvent themselves. And I also think that the future of book selling lies somewhere else, like in Sam's Club or in BJ's Wholesale Club, because they have no problem buying books in bulk. I would rather sit and turn pages, dog ear pages, flip right. through the pages, smell the print. Mm -hmm. There's something intrinsically. Yeah, I love those paper cuts on my nose. Mm. Oh, no. <laughs> no, but I mean, there's something, yeah. there's something mm. very pleasing about holding a book in your hands. Right, yeah. And most of the, so. most people I know online, they all would prefer a bound book. Right. Right, yes. A I lot too. of people at work seem to like the Kindle. Um, some of the women I spoke with, they have those things. They prefer the electronic version. I like to travel, and I think I'd rather have one thing to turn around rather than six paperback books. My only and then also a Kindle and a Nook, they're unitaskers. You can only read a book with it, whereas if you get like an iPad or a Zoom, you could read books and do all kinds of other things right. Right. You know, in between when you're not using it. So it's almost like something you would carry with you all the time. Right. You could use it to take pictures, you could use it to call people with, with you know, Skype or phone, you know, something yeah, like that. Right. So basically, our in our humble opinion, folks, bookstores are here to stay. It's just that they're not going to look the same a few years down the road as what we're used to right now. And that's it for this roundtable discussion for October. And now it's time for toys, props, and other stuff, where we point out the wonderful world of collectibles and speaks about them. Okay, on one side we have X-Men First Class, now available on Blu-ray and DVD. Very nice. My wife was nice enough to get me a copy last night when it came out, as we taped. So She's that's a really good cool. woman, that. Next to that was a, a birthday gift from uh, my good friend Kevin. It is a pack of playing cards, James Bond, and, and instead of having like the, the faces of the different suits, they're original theatrical James Bond posters, uh, oh. mostly from like the 60s and 70s, and that's a really cool set. Very nice. And next to that is Greta Mazinga. God um, bless you. Yeah. It's a alarm clock which actually speaks in, in Japanese, and it's it's really cool, and I, I like it. Okay. Leads to a whole new series of excuses. Boss, my alarm clock didn't go off in English. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on Focus. There we go. On the left is uh, Lev Grossman's The Magicians, a story about a young boy, uh, about 17 years old, about ready to go to college, and uh, he's all he thinks about is about this uh, magical uh, fantasy land called Fillory, which was written back in the like 1930s, 40s, kind of like Narnia. And uh, he's kind of bored and he's trying to get ready for college. And all of a sudden he finds himself 
in a school for magicians up in upstate New York. And it turns out that there is real magic. Um, you know, he can do all kinds of card manipulation and sleight of hand tricks, but now he's learning all kinds of uh, ways of manipulating real time and space, you know, as a magician can. Um, Which so comes in really handy when he has to turn in his papers for yeah. school. Yep. So, uh, you yeah, know, they can just prop right into the, you know, anyway. So, <laughs> so the, uh, so this young guy, he's, he's learning magic, uh, you know, but he still thinks about fillery and stuff. And so it's sort of a mix between the two kind of stories of him learning magic and him thinking about the, uh, the fantasy land that he likes, that he grew up reading. Uh, in the middle there is Metatropolis. It's an audiobook, a collection of uh, five different stories uh, set in the same kind of uh, post-apocalyptic uh, uh, world. Uh, written by some of the greats like John Scalzi, uh, Elizabeth Baer, and um, some other authors there. And it's also voiced uh, with three of the actors from the, uh, the Battlestar Galactica series that was on the Sci-Fi Channel. And then to the le uh, right of that is The Book of Cthulhu. Uh, it's a collection, uh, anthology of all kinds of short stories. Uh, set in the uh, Cthulhu universe, uh, created by H.P. Lovecraft. Rhode Island's own? Yep. yep. Uh, authors like David Drake, Charles Strauss, and Elizabeth Baer also are in that. And that's an excellent book. And over here on the left, we have Wallace and Gromit, the collection uh, Wallace and Gromit and the Were Rabbit, and uh, the Three Adventures, um, the Close Shave, hmm. um, the Wrong Trousers, and uh, his original uh, Trip to the Moon. Yep. Um, so that's a, a nice little DVD set um, because Ardman Animation is coming out with the new movie, the Pirates one. In the, then there's Go Gogeta, the original Godzilla film uh, released by the, was it Classic Media. Um, it's excellent. The uh, original film has a little bit darker tone than the American Raymond Burr version, although I grew up watching Raymond Burr and I liked him. So it was, it was good, and it has both versions in there and uh, some other background uh, extras in there. Then there's Rocky and Bullwinkle, Volume 1, The Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle. Yep. Moose, Moose and Squirrel. Moose and Squirrel. Yes, but it also includes Dudley Do-Right and... Um, Fractured Fairy Tales. Fractured Fairy Tales. Yep, very good. And um, uh, Peabody and Sherman. Nice. The Wayback Machine. Hey, Rocky, yeah. watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Nothing but sleeve. Presto! I don't even know my own strength. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, the can tell how old we are, huh? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, we're still five-year-olds. Yes, exactly. On the right is Charlene yeah. Harris's first uh, dead novel, Dead Until Dark, yep. which uh, is the basis for the True Blood television series on HBO. Awesome series. I have not seen True Blood yet, but when reading this book, I kept imagining the actress's voice doing the part of Suki Stackhouse, and it was a really good, fun read. Um, it is an adult novel. It's not a young adult. It's an adult nope. novel. Um, but it, it does have its own take on you know, the world of uh, vampires and other unearthly creatures. Um, so, I mean, I would highly recommend this book if you really like uh, vampires. But but there's so many other uh, series out there too. My wife has been reading one by PC and Kristen Cast. It's about like a fallen angel and this whole high school Great. where you go to, you know, you learn to be I don't know angelic or something like that. And there's another one with more vampires and werewolves. This seems like werewolves and vampires it's just very, can't get along. Yeah, it's very popular right now. Yes. Okay. But uh, so everyone's been jumping on that bandwagon. Yep. And last we got a whole bunch of uh, Storm clone troopers, and the new show. Star Wars Clone Wars premiered when? September? Yeah. September 16th. So if you like Clone Wars, there you go. Enjoy yourself. All right. As always, if you want to get in touch with us, our website is www.risfc.org. Please go to our website, get more information about meetings and other information on how to get in touch with us, because we have Facebook and YouTube yes. pages as well. Okay, that's going to be it for this October 2011 edition of Sci-Fi Journal. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you in... November.